screen for you. How are you, Andres? You. We're here from the Oftalmo University campus in Argentina and South America, waiting for all of you guys, our last webisode. Hello everyone, welcome, welcome back to the first Virtual Refractive Summit. This is the last webisode. We're so happy, so happy. Finally, we're here, this amazing journey that we have been doing together. Today is gonna to be very special because we have a lot of surprises. As you know, a great team of speakers, translators, the Family University team, the Alcon Experience Academy with us. So we're very happy and we hope we really enjoy together this incredible uh, webisode. As you know, uh, we started this journey together at the beginning of the month in June. We were talking about workflows in refractive surgery. Then we talk about techniques. Uh, last week, we were talking about uh, customized laser surgery. We had an incredible webinar. And today, finally, we're going to talk about the future, what's happening in the future with the refractive surgery, with the trans innovations of of course, the market. Um, I want to thank, because this is the last webisode, so I really want to thank a lot of people that we are doing uh, an amazing job. We have 18 uh, key opinion leaders with us during this month of June. We really want to thank all of you guys. Thanks for your presence here with, with us. I want to really thank our translators. We have eight different translators from different countries doing an amazing, amazing work with the translation. So thank you so much, guys. And after this webisode, we're going to have more than 1,000 attend live attendees. So thank you so much to our colleagues for uh, all the support. Uh, we, are, we are so proud that you like this, uh, this project. And also in YouTube, you can go and watch all our videos. We already have more than 1,300 views in our channel in YouTube. And of course, also this content is in the Icon Experience Academy website. So you have a lot of options to keep watching our content. Uh, as always, we have a very interactive uh, webinar today. So go to menti.com. You just have to put the call and you have three questions. Very, you can answer very quick. And that is very important for us because during the webinar, we're gonna see the results and we're gonna discuss about those questions. Uh, well, this slide, we love this one because uh, talk about the academy and industry working together, this beautiful synergy. And this, is, this summit is the result of this synergy. And today we have a very special guest with us is Faustino Vidal La Roca. Right now he's in Italy. And um, Faustino, are you here? Hello, everyone. Yes, here I am, based in Milano, watching the European Cup. So finally, I'm originally Spanish, so very happy that we get classified very soon, <laughs> recently. <laughs> So with this, no, very honor and, and thank you, thank you for this invitation. So I am a fan, I come in from academia too. So I know what means uh, being in academia and try to collaborate with industry. I think that the, everything is changing, the environment. I am coming from Alcon right now. And uh, what I wanted to say, and especially to everyone listening, in particularly the, the new generation that maybe they need more than others, because uh, we have here the panelists with Luis, Eileen, Luz Marina, and everyone. So KOL that they can teach you. And this is lovely. Sometimes we need uh, the collaboration with, uh, with industry. Why? Because the complexity of the technology is increasing, right? So we need to be more partnered to understand how system that works. I think that the patient are more 
constrained in what they want, in particularly in these uh, pandemic days that everyone is reading about everything. We have now experts in all the therapeutic areas. We have epidemiologists, biologists. We have all the medical school now at home. So that means that they need a lot of information. What that means is that the training and education of the doctors is very, very important and, and crucial, right? And as a third point, and then I close, I think that um, we collaborating together, you know, that we have a lot of research programs. We can listen to you and help others how we can develop their machines for better safety for our patients and easiest for you. And additionally to that, I think that uh, alconexperienceacademy.com, for example, is, uh, is something that we are using a lot. Uh, we are trying to implement artificial intelligence in this software and everything where they can suggest you which are your main topics, how you want it to do. We are working with simulators. Uh, what that means is that we will try to train people at a distance. So having Luis in Spain and myself in Italy, and maybe he can teach me how to do a correct capsule is finally, right? Using uh, all this uh, simulator is, uh, I think, that very, very destructive with this. Um, what to say? Thank you, Ophthalmo University. I think that you are doing a great job in uh, recruiting all these amazing panelists, right? Uh, they, they come and they teach you. And this is uh, amazing what we do, and we learn everyone. So with this, Andres, uh, everyone, good luck with the meeting and always available for questions on how we can interact. Remember that there are a lot of now research grant and application at um, different governmental level or commission level where you need synergy with industry. So remember that we can collaborate in that field on too. So not only training, but collaborating. So let's submit some grants together and get some funding from the European Commission at least. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Faustino. We, we really want to recognize your, your job, your work, the Icon Experience Academy team. Also, Charmaine, she's traveling right now, but we have a little surprise for her today. Uwe, thanks, Uwe, for your support. And all again, all the Icon Experience Academy, thank you so much, because it's very important to recognize all the job that you are doing, all the effort that you are doing, the content and all these programs. So thank you so much. And also, uh, if we have to say thanks, we have to say thank you to our speakers. Every webisode, we, we talk about different concepts like generosity, kindness, willingness. So I think we can summarize all of these concepts in the greatness of our speakers. So thank you so much for your amazing contribution to this summit, guys. And if we talk about the, the speakers, I have to talk about our lovely uh, eight different translators, as just said at the beginning. I really want to thank to Svetlava, uh, Constantine, Luz Marina, uh, Marcelo, Mariano, Kirill, and Cesar, because you guys, it would have been impossible without you. So thank you so much. Well, of course, our partners, Custom Surgical and Bionico Models, thank you so much for your support. Uh, we have a few more days where you, you can uh, take advantage of the 50% off if you use the code of Talmo 12 or Bionico VRS code in the Bionico um, website. And for now, until the next, uh, for the less, next 24 hours, you can get a 25% off if you use the code MyCorrect11. And at the finally, at the final, we're gonna have the special reward of $500 from Custom Search Card. Thank you so much, guys. For the refractive mentors, colleagues, peers, thank you so much for your support. Uh, the journey is just beginning, so stay tuned because we have a lot of surprises and a lot of activities in the next month. Uh, this is maybe one of the most important thing for us, the scholarship, we have a lot of scholarship we want to have uh, many colleagues from all over the world where is Evo right now doing refractive surgery with us. So during this week and next week, we're gonna record the videos doing the giveaways and uh, we, we will tell you who are the winners. But we have a lot of scholarships for you. So we are very happy about that. 
Finally, we're going to start with the webinar today. Group of speakers, we are so honored to have all of them. So, uh, Ivo Ferreira, he doesn't need any presentation. Ivo, in Mexico City, how are you, my friend? Oh, I am very happy. You know me, Andres, already. Uh, I'm here with the amazing elite. I'm going to learn a lot. And today we're going to have an amazing experience. We're going to take uh, this technology to the limit. Mm -hmm. We're going to do a very, very interesting case, completely personalized. And I want all the panel to guide me and to teach me refractive surgery. And today. Uh, for the very first time, and from Turkey, Dr. Eileen Kilic. Eileen, thank you so much uh, for being here. We're excited about your presentation. Thanks. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, I'm very excited to be here. This is great honor for me. I hope uh, it will be very uh, beneficial, and I am sure I will learn so many things also. Thank you, Eileen. Thank you so much. Well. Uh, from France, I know you were in, in the OR, so thank you so much, Damien, for being here also. We are excited and happy to, to have you with, with all of us today. Thank you. It's a pleasure also. Thank you, Damien. And a friend of us, uh, our dear Luis Fernandez Vega from Spain. Thank you so much, Luis. What a pleasure. Thank you, Andres, Ivo, and Oftalmo University. Well, as you know, guys, every webisode, we have a, a goal, we have a summit, and let's see what is our way to the summit. Today, we're going to have three uh, basic pillars. We're going to talk about lace economic, the refractive surgery market, and of course, a sneak peek into the future. It's going to be very, very interesting and fun. Again, go to menti.com, please help us with the, the survey. You have to put the code 5602. 6308 and you will uh, answer all the questions are just three questions very quick so let me tell you uh, a little bit more about this uh, section that we call as economics I, I want to show you uh, very quick three slides talking about some numbers if we see the global refractive procedures by region in, in the world we can see that China has the 20 almost 25 percent of the market U.S. almost 20, Western Europe at 50%, and for example, Latin America, we have less than 10% of the market. But if we see the global laser vision correction candidate pool, uh, we can see that in U.S., after applying different uh, filters like age, uh, incomes, or refractive errors, we have uh, 132 million uh, candidates, eyes candidates. And if you see here, the laser vision correction procedures in 2019 is less than 800,000. So Western Europe, we have more than 60 million uh, candidate eyes. And again, the laser, laser visual correction in 2019, before of course, 2019, is less than 100,000. So the US penetration rate is less than 5%. And and that's one of the points that we want to focus today because we understand that in refractive surgery for the next year, we have to focus in technology, investment, superlative results. And of course, we have to keep improving our patient education. We have no doubt that the future looks brighter than ever, but we have to put our efforts in these three points. And I want to open the game for all of our speakers, uh, Luis, I'd like to have your comments about these numbers. You are a great expert in refractive surgery. You have an amazing institute in Spain. So what can you tell me, my friend? Luis, uh, you are mute. Sorry. Uh, that I, I was saying that the, the, that research that you've done is great because we have loads of information that you have just told us. Uh, I think that those numbers tell us that refractive uh, surgery is a popular procedure, but it can be even more in the future. We have loads of patients that can be benefits uh, for those treatments. We have 
each uh, year or each five years more uh, safe procedures and we have loads of options for all of those patients so maybe we can uh, try to reach them uh, uh, in an easier way that we are doing now that's what i what i read uh, behind all of those numbers that you told us excellent thank you luis Damian, uh, what, do you, what do you think about it? I mean, we can see that the market of the practice surgery is gonna arise in the few years, in the next few years, but what, what is your opinion? About the trends uh, in the market? You know, I think that it's a very multifactorial issue because mm -hmm. the economy is important and uh, the pandemic was uh, uh, hitting us, uh, but positively. Uh, in Europe because uh, many patients had time to come and uh, visit us for pre-op checks where, while they were on uh, distance work. They were at home instead of going to their office. Mm -hmm. so we were, we were uh, having a lot of... Uh, uh, we, we see, we, we've seen an increase in, uh, in the pre-op checks and therefore we've seen an increase in the... Um, uh, total number of uh, LASIK and PRK and etc. we did last year compared to the year uh, before that, that is uh, 2019. So uh, uh, I see, I think uh, refractive surgery is, is a st overall steady business over the last years. It's a bit robust to many things. It can be surprisingly uh, affected positively by some uh, dramatic events like the pandemic. And uh, I think uh, what is remarkable also is the stability of LASIK because uh, this is that the technique that is still here to stay. Um, of course, you can mention SMILE and uh, PRK also still is there, but uh, uh, LASIK is really here to stay, I think, for, for some time. And we will see other techniques coming like add-ons, like uh, IOLs to compete with. Mm -hmm. But um, I don't see this going away, and this is because it combines uh, precision, safety, and I think in terms of uh, precision, this is the most precise technique ever that we had. So um, I'm confident for that. Uh, absolutely, uh, and Inch definitely, the, uh, absolute the COVID nineteen or was a game changer. I, Eileen. What is the, uh, the situation in, in your country, in that part of Europe? What, what do you think? Uh, recently, uh, during pandemic, of course, LASIK uh, numbers increased because uh, patients were at home. They listened to yourself more and also a lot of difficulty uh, because of some uh, fog on glasses and for hygiene people couldn't use contact lens a lot and uh, during this period really a LASIK increase uh, so uh, when we compare about uh, past and future uh, in the past uh, maybe LASIK uh, numbers higher than today uh, one period maybe 20 years ago maybe 10 years ago uh, mm -hmm. but I expect for future uh, numbers uh, will be better uh, during pandemic may be helpful for future also because uh, there is a motivation for patients and when there is more patients it will be good reference for others and uh, technology developed more uh, than uh, past and we can obtain more uh, precision, uh, better results, better intraocular lens quality. So uh, I agree in the future, uh, refractive surgery uh, will be a higher volume. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank, thank you, Eileen. Very interesting. Uh, you know, before we go with Ivo, that I can see he's taking note. Last night we were talking about this, right? To offer uh, extraordinary results. That is one of one of the key for the future. What do you think? Well, I mean, I think that uh, the technology is there. I have to recognize a brain like uh, Damien that is helping a lot to the technology. I hear that refractive surgery, of course, 
technologically needs a brain behind, right? And I think that uh, we need to develop more and more specific personalized treatment. I think that what we will require in the future is personalized treatment. So uh, the patient, every patient is different and every patient needs something different. Indeed, uh, Damien touched a point too about the IOLs, the competitors, mm -hmm. and maybe in the future, why not? What they think about presbyopia correcting drops, right? So there is uh, a lot of things working in that field. <laughs> exactly. So many, many things coming in and uh, refractive surgery, by the way, new generations are coming very strong too, right? So and, uh, the way that we use our eyes is completely different with the technology too. So it's the perfect storm, right? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Eileen. You wanted to say also, something? Also, Sorry. we expect in the future myopia myopia rate will increase. We expect more myopia than mm -hmm. before. And also, this is one of reasons to increase refractive surgery. I would expect because of this reason. Yes, and, and also the, the fact that the more time elapses, the more the patient has trust in refractive surgery. Now we hit a stage where we have the children of the first LASIK patient that come to the market. And when you have your parents uh, operated, uh, and of course they are doing well, it's really encouraging the children to do the same thing. And myops, as Aline said, are increasing. Uh, myops parents create myopic children. So it's uh, really uh, going in the same direction of an increase in the indication uh, over time. And if, if, you know, like 15 years ago, people were saying, well, LASIK is okay, but what if 10 years from now there is a problem? And now we are uh, almost 20, 25 years from these, these cases. And of course, we know it's not going to be, uh, we, we, we are not, really um, seeing something bad happening. Uh, so um, this is changing the game a bit and uh, refractive surgery is now well admitted. It has also gained a lot in uh, scientific reputation. Uh, again, 20 years ago, LASIK surgeons were like pushing button doctors who just flap and zap and don't think. Now, if you listen to colleagues, they're like, well, refractive surgery. Well, I was in a Congress and the guy came and he spoke about polynomials. He spoke about wound healing. He spoke about uh, things like that, uh, optical aberration. And I, I, I could not understand a word. Uh, <laughs> and, 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 and you see, so, it, so we are regarded now like a little brainy people, which is good. <laughs> but that's completely changed. No, no, but that's, I'm serious. I remember 20 years when I started. So like, ah, oh, refractive surgery, money makers, uh, no brainers. And now it's a bit different. Also, we will have a older population in the, in the following decades. So that will make us to have more cataract uh, refractive surgeries. And also the, the active population in presbyopia age will be, uh, uh, we will have more patients in that age. So that will also increase the, the refractive surgery and we will have to be ready for that. Also, also LASIK, LASIK parents uh, will ask solution for us uh, because they want still uh, life without glasses because when they are presbyopic age, this population also increased. Already in the past, they had uh, this uh, demand and when they get older, uh, they, will, they, they want to continue, of course. We have more LASIK cataract than before. Exactly. What, a, what an incredible discussion. We can keep talking for hours, but I have... A We can't hear you anymore. Yeah, no, I, I think we lost you. Andres. We lost Andres. Yes. Can you see me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, because I'm next. Go on. Okay, perfect. So, uh, guys, I'm taking notes. 
Okay, um, I have this obsession now with taking notes and I have a couple of very, very good things there. But before that, I want to talk a little bit about this summit concept that Andres was talking about. Uh, and I want to thank Andres, Faustino, Uwe and Shemaine who were behind this amazing idea. And the, the thing I want to add to that summit that you can see there is the campus. So many people don't understand what happens here in the campus, but what happens here is basically we have a simulated environment in where you can, you know, or bring patients or simulate patients and then go through the experience, the complete experience for doing femtolytic, transpirer K, many, many, many things. So um, that's what we want to do today. Uh, and I want, you know, all that amazing panel to teach me how to do it. But before that, uh, and, and this is going to be mostly connected from what uh, a very, very good friend is, Dr. Damien Gatinello is going to be talking about, is to, to talk about presbyopia. Why? Because I'm a cataract surgeon. And I, I know there's many cataract surgeons there in the panel, right? <laughs> so um, sometimes we don't think of presbyopia as somebody who can be approached with refractive surgery. But uh, Damien has amazing news for us. So basically, the first thing I wanted to say is, uh, and we, I was talking with a very good friend yesterday that is here with us, that is Jason, is that presbyopia is a huge uh, problem. It's actually a huge problem from, for healthcare. Uh, and if we have somebody, something that Damien said it, and I think it was amazing, he said, safety and precision it's still owned by LASIK surgery. So what if we have that also for presbyopia? Uh, I just want you guys to see the numbers. 863 million of people with near visual impairment. So that's a lot of people, right? So we need to talk about presbyopia. Kind of not, not only with uh, intraocular lenses, but basically this is what I do, uh, how I reason in my private practice with my patients. Uh, I do something of monovision. Of course, I give people, you know, trifocal glasses to wear. I'm a lot into multifocal contact lenses. I think, you know, they have a place. And I do a lot of not only trifocals, but, you know, uh, presbyopia correcting IOLs. So I think today, I'm just waiting, you know, for Damien to tell us how we can approach presbyopia with refractive surgery, exactly because of what he said. He said, safety and precision. And for me, those are very, very important things when I come to my patients. So Damien, please, what do you do in your practice? I would love to know and learn from you because, you know, when I have a patient I'm thinking about him not only today, but what's going to happen in 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, right? We have patients who will evolve in their vision, and I'm thinking about that. What, is, what are your thoughts about it? Well, uh, for presbyopia, the, the equation is also uh, multivariable. Um, I think, as you said, this is really... Uh, the, the, the segment of the population we should target because uh, they are uh, really uh, more and more and um, the solutions that we have uh, are increasing in safety and precision. Uh, the, the first thing I would like to say is when you have a presbyopic patient, the dichotomy is usually should I do corneal surgery or should I do lens surgery and sometimes the indication are difficult to really uh, choose between because uh, there are borderline patients, 65, clear lens, uh, small hyperopia, lasik works, but if cataract occurs five years from now, maybe, etc., etc. So lens versus cornea, and uh, you have also the myops versus the hyperopes. Myops, usually they like monovision, um, they don't like multifocality as much as hyperop can, can be satisfied with. Um, that's the second kind of dichotomy. Then you have associated conditions. If you have dry eye, if you have glaucoma, this is also in this 
age range more common to have. That's another issue. I would say also that men and women, in my experience, do not react the same. Women seems easier to satisfy than men with presbyopia surgery. Um, um, so um, this is again a very uh, complex uh, uh, diagram or tree to go through decision tree. And uh, we have also new techniques and Eileen knows about these the add-ons, uh, synthetic add-ons or uh, uh, allogenic add-ons. Uh, we have uh, probably at some point true accommodative IOLs, which will work and that will be exchanging the game. Before we have these multifocal IOLs will still be there. Um, and um, currently, again, I'm doing a lot of LASIK, I would say. I'm not doing as many clear lens extractions as many surgeons do, uh, because in my opinion, in my experience with Parisian people, um, people are sensitive to the change more than to what you give them. That is, when they have a big cataract and are uh, unhappy with their vision, mono multifocal IOL will work as well as a monofocal in terms of, of, of subjective visual quality, but it, they will offer spectacular independence. On the other hand, if you have clear lens people in their 40s, especially the low myopes, that's a, that's a tricky situation and sometimes they don't like multifocality. So uh, with IOLs, I mean, so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm more inclining people with really no cataract and low ametropia toward LASIK and would probably orient my patients to IOL-based surgery when they have cataract when they have the age of cataract and, uh, and, and when they have a, a big ametropia and experience with multifocal contact lenses, things like that. Damien, what a great insight. Uh, and I think that is one of the most difficult decision, right? Uh, current treatment or IOL um, treatment surgery. So why don't you start with your presentation because you have uh, just a presentation about this and we would love to, to see what is your opinion about this. Uh, yes, I can try to, to show you a, 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 some slides about that. Uh, so in fact, I have two. Yes, so um, do you okay. see the screen now? Yeah, yeah so uh, yeah. I'm a consultant. Perfect. This is my financial interest. I'm consulting for Alcon Wavelight. And um, I work with my colleagues who contribute to many results I'm showing to you. So, uh, again, we've, we've mentioned accommodation is a problem for presbyopes. Interestingly, accommodation in the human eye is quite complex. In, in some animals, this is on the right of the slide, it's easier because the lens moves. And I, I believe that if we had a mechanism like birds or, or fishes, that is moving back and forth the lens like, like, like it works in photo camera uh, lens objectives, that would be easier than a soft lens that deforms under a pressure applied on the zonula, et cetera, et cetera. But we have to cope with this. And again, uh, this is something that we all know happens by the edge of 40 something. And uh, interestingly also, it's usually 42, 43 years. And, uh, some men lost their hairs by the age of 25, some never. You know, it's, there is a large variability in aging in many things, but in presbyopia, most patients are presbyop by the age of 41, 42. That means they reach a stage where accommodation is not good enough to make them read uh, comfortably at a distance of 40 centimeters. So um, again, what we discussed was that lens or cornea, that's the question. Of course, we have now new tools that we can use for uh, selecting the best indication. And uh, in my opinion also, when you had LASIK, it's easy in the future now with new formula to still do an IOL power calculation and convert to uh, cataract surgery and even maybe, maybe multifocal IOLs. And same, if you do multifocal IOL surgery, Keep in mind that if you have a refractive surprise, LASIK will be there um, on the side to, 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 to restore emetropia. So I always explain my patient that these surgeries will be combined at some point maybe. So I call this like 
echoing keratoconus form first cataract and form first cataract is difficult to detect. We have those signs that are classical glare, um, little halos at night, difficulties when um, there is a big uh, coming uh, light like car headlights, etc., etc. Of course, you have slit lamp examination. Everyone knows that. People use shine fluke sometimes. Others like me use a double pass because it's an objective scatter index with the OCAS or HD analyzer. The issue is that we don't know where the scatter comes from. So you have to combine this with clinical examination, but in patient where vitreous is okay, retina is okay, and cornea is okay. If you have scatter, it's presumably the lens and it's usually well corrected with the aspect of the, at the slit lamp. So what we do in fact is detect scatter and scatter is caused by the same aging process which makes the lens harder. This is prosbiopia and then less transparent. This is a cataract, but aging starts by, we, by the age of uh, one year old maybe and progressively our lens becomes stiffer and then lose term transparency. So I like the OCAS again. And if I have an OCAS more than two, usually it's a good orientation in my mind toward uh, cataract or lens-based uh, surgery. Uh, we have also worked in my department with other techniques because if you have the IOL Master 700, if you have the anterior from Heidelberg, if you have uh, probably also the Axtrait, you can have images because these are swept source OCTs that can enable you to see the lens. I mean, see cross-sectional image of the lens and you, we, we have published ways to analyze the gray density, the average lens density in pixel unit. And from this, try also to diagnose objectively uh, the, the level of opacification. Now, if you ask me about corneal presbyopic surgery, that is LASIK and, uh, and, and PRK maybe, uh, not, I'm not speaking about adding add-on add technique, which I did in the past for inlays like the camera, but I, I quit with this. There is always the dichotomy between monovision and multifocality and uh, also guidelines like it's better to try the dominant eye for far and the non-dominant eye for near, but there are exceptions. And multifocality to me is a fuzzy concept because monovision and multifocality are very tied together. And uh, I would say that if you do a multifocal technique, for example, for the dominant eye, what you need to show and, de and demonstrate is that this multifocality is better than monovision in the sense that it provides the eye, which is for near, still, uh, I, I'm, I'm confused. No, I, I will start with the non-dominant eye, yes. The non-dominant eye, which is for near, should be seeing better than the dis than, than the, than, um, than if you had done monovision. So if you do monovision, you know that the distance, the distance vision will not be great. But if you do multifocality, it's for improving the distance vision of the non-dominant eye. Of course, you induce near vision, but you make the eye with more lines of distance uncorrected. So stereopsis is a bit better and there's less difference between two eyes. And if you do multifocality on the dominant eye, which is usually for distance, it's just to provide the dominant eye with a bit better near than if you had done a pure dominant eye correction. So if you demonstrate the two items, then it's true effective multifocality. Else I call this monovision. In my experience, again, multifocality may not be useful with my, my host because they, they will tell you, if, if, if you give me near, I want the same near that myopia provides me. If you give me distance, I want the same distance that contact lenses give me. Hyperops are a different story. They, they don't see where at distant, they don't see where at near. They are uh, always uh, impaired in the vision. The, the reference system is not as good as the myopes when they are corrected because usually they, they live without correction or with minimum correction. So it works well in, for these reasons with them. And emetropes can be monovisioned or can be multifocalized depending on contact lens trial. So I always do a contact lens trial in those patients. And uh, uh, I, I've learned also that if you have a high multifocal technique, don't do it on the dominant eye. If you have mild multifocality and I have techniques for that myself, you can do it. But again, the success will be that if you have a multifocal uh, correction, it must be judged 
satisfactory for distance by the patient. Else, even if he reads well, he will feel uh, uncomfortable. Um, so um, you know all these things. I'm not gonna bore you with these things. And uh, I will show you clinical things like this. This is an example of a post-LASIK multifocal non-dominant eye surgery. It looks very prolate, steep in the center, flat in the periphery. This is the refractive map, which is probably the best map for cornea. You see it's steep in the center and flat in the periphery. But still, I can tell you, I selected this map because the patient was not really doing well at near. He had, he had correct distance visual acuity, but did not do well. And still he had uh, asphericity of minus 0.1. He had corneal spherical aberration negative. So everything which is usually giving patient with good, good near is like a hyperopic prolate operated LASIK. He has negative spherical aberration. The problem with this patient is the non-myopic uh, sufficient induced error. So I'm saying this to you because I attend many lectures in conventions where colleagues of mine, uh, very est estimated colleagues, come and say, this is my technique for presbyopia with this laser. And they don't really mention what they are doing in the dioptric unit. They say we use circular aberration. They say we use blended things. We use, uh, they have many marketing-like terms, but at the end of the day, if you want to have a near vision, you need myopia somewhere in your eye. Myopia means one image at near is conjugated with the retina. Of course, it doesn't have to be in the whole pupil, but if you want to read at 40 centimeters, unless I didn't, I'm, 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 I don't understand optics, you must have a, somewhere a minus 1.5, minus 2 dioptric power in, on the minus sign. So the rays coming from the close object go to your retina. So I am maybe too... Too, uh, too strict, but the best map I use in multifocality, and this works also for IOLs, as long as they are not diffractive, sorry, is this um, doubt trick from the OPD scan. It shows you simply the local error. And if you do multifocal surgery, refractive, you must look at that because it's the whole eye. It's not the cornea because the cornea is only part of the story. And it shows you the real multifocality. In this case, multifocality is from minus 0 0.7 to plus 1.5. So multifocality per se is there. There is 2.25 diopters of multifocal error or gradient, but it's not well adjusted so that the center is on the myopic side and the edge is on the emetropic side. That's the problem. The bottom line is that if you don't target myopia somewhere, in your pupil, you're not going to have a patient reading well as shown here. This is also the Q value confusion we had in Europe. When presby LASIK was introduced, surgeons said, I'm going to correct my hyperopic patient and fine tune the Q value, it gives multifocality. Well, if you do this, this is, for example, a patient that you have induced, uh, uh, you want to do surgery on. If you just modify the Q value, it will make the patient hyperopic on the edge because the cornea is just flatter. So it doesn't work at all. So as for rising the cornea induced distance correction, I mean, reduces myopia, not induces it. If you want to work this well for hyperopic presbyopic patient, what you need to do is first induce myopia for the central part of the pupil. And here I show you the red curve. This is the post-op cornea. If you don't as for eyes, if you just do blunt monovision, and then if you do asphorization, you don't change much the apical power, the central power of the cornea, but you make it less powerful in the direction of the periphery. So against what's been thought in the past, more negative Q value are increasing distance correction for those kind of treatment, not near. It just reduces the myopia correction that you put in the center of the pupil. I hope it's clear on this cross-sectional cross diagram. So if you have this in mind, you understand that to here, 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 I'm sorry, there is some uh, overlapping sound, but what I'm saying here is that this is working well now. Cornea is prolate, you see, uh, uh, circular aberration is negative, but 
the myopia that's induced is okay for near. It's more than in the previous example. And this is, again, what you want. You want, you want a cornea which is uh, prolate, but also that induces a... Um, a um, that induces a myopic a, uh, error. So the near target will be conjugated with the retina through the center of the cornea. And in the periphery, the rays will conjugate distance targets with the retina. The retina is orange. That's what you want to achieve multifocality that I would call near in the center. That's one way to do it. And I can show you why it works and demonstrate it. This is two kinds of patients. The first at the top is classic monovision. As you can see, myopia is the same more or less throughout the pupil. There are high order aberrations that modulate, but it's between 1.5 and 2.75 diopters of myopia. So it's, it's, it's myopia. And of course, the distance target image simulation is on the right, it's blurred with 20, 60, 20, 80 maximum visual acuity, not more than that. Now, if you do multifocal monovision and do an OPD scan and ask for the retinal image for distance, what you can see is clearly a gain in the, in the charts with uh, letters you can read. Of course, they are a bit fuzzy, but still you can read them at maybe 20, 30. So it's completely different from 2080. And the difference in visual acuity between eyes is much less. So on your dominant eye, you should probably try to do uh, myopization just in the center of the pupil and use multifocality to reduce it toward the periphery. So that's again, uh, what's, what we do. And you have situations like this when patients have nuclear cataract. Again, they, are, they have myopia in the center, emetropia in the periphery and they have like uh, sometimes good distance vision, but they say, oh, my, my near vision has increased. That's because of this multifocality, which is not specific to, to laser surgery. So, um, uh, and, and this is an interesting chart. I see many patients that are operated as, elsewhere. And you can see here examples of OPD scan maps after supracore, intracore, press beyond, etc., and they all have the same myopic issue in the center and emetropia in the periphery. So all techniques are more or less like this, but they are called differently. And usually companies do not disclose those kind of maps. They, they are black boxes or they just tell you, yeah, we use negative circular aberration. But at the end, it's more or less myopia in the center and rapid emetropization toward the periphery. So, um, I'm, I'm going to skip this as well, but what we, what I have designed with the Alcon laser that I used before with the custom Q issue is to use a, a, a mathematical approach to determine how much free aberration I need. And also to determine, once I know this, which change in asphericity is required. So the answer is about minus 0.6. So to make it simple, if you have hyperopic corrections, for the non-dominant eye, what you have to do is make the center myopic, so correct the distance vision plus an addition of about two diopters, and then make the cornea prolate, so there is less, uh, there is less um, uh, myopia in the periphery of the pupil, and there is better distance corrected vision, as I showed you with the OPD scan simulation. We have published this, if you are interested in, for the theory and the clinical results, and on the paper on the right, what we did is compared what we were doing with the read approach with monovision. And we showed that with the read, the non-dominant eye has better vision than if you uh, have monovision. So we had patient that we did contact lens trial before the surgery. We recall that they had, they had clear lens, of course. We record their distance visual acuity on the non-dominant eye. Then we did this read on the non-dominant eye and we compared their distance uncorrected visual acuity with, with what they had with the contact lens, like classic monovision, and they were doing better with a uh, gain in lines at distance. So we have proven that this works and that's better than monovision. I tell you this because in America, many surgeons say, oh, multifocality doesn't work. It's like monovision. It's a bit like monovision as I showed you, but it's not exactly monovision. So uh, the read is like this. It's a software where you have the option. You select one eye. The first eye is the one that is non-dominant eye. So you must know 
Before that, which eye is a non-dominant one? You press right or left, depending on which eye is a non-dominant one. Before that, you have to do Vario. You have to do a lot of uh, acquisition. I mean, just one acquisition uh, with one instrument, but several one, which will be average to provide you with those classic uh, customization tools. And uh, especially aspherity will be measured with the topolizer Vario. Angle Kappa will be compensated for, and that's very important. I would also recommend you to do large cuts, and that's very nice with the FS200, which is, in my opinion, and uh, it can be challenged, but for LASIK, the best femto by far, especially for hyperose, because you can have large and thick flaps if you need, like mine. Mine by default is 9.5. And, and then you can uh, again um, uh, decenter, as you show here, 75% toward the vertex when you do your ablation to improve again visual quality. So I'm not centering on the center of the pupil. All these patients are on the vertex or 75% from the, the vertex. And you can see here the large flap created will enable all the spots. It is for the dominant eye here but you will see that when you do 9.5, it's not oversized. Uh, as you can see, the spots are really uh, close to the edge margin, but they are not on the epithelial side either. So you have good post-op uh, outcomes. So the read is shown here. On the non-dominant eye, you have the distance vision, which is plus two, the read add, which is 2.5. This is by, the, by default one to cover all press biopic error to come. So the treatment will be the sum of the two, but the shift in Q value will be by default minus 0.6. And it shows you the delta spherical aberration here, which is usually efficient when about 0.4 or slightly less than that, provided again, what you do is to correct myopia in the center, else it's not going to work. So that's how it's done. You do first your distance correction. You, you enter this. This is a non-dominant eye. And uh, so the value has measured aspherity, pupil, uh, vertex location. I think, guys, we, we lost we lost Damien. We have a, a trouble with the connection. So, uh, Luis, what what an incredible to, what it's incredible to have um, different options for our patient. I know you are you have a lot of experience with the well, but what about this a, a corneal treatment? What do you think, Luis? Well, after Damian presentation that he has a lot of experience with that, it's very little to add. Uh, may, maybe uh, we have two different, of course, between myopes and hyperopes. It's not the same uh, myo patient of 40, 50, 60, or a hyper patient of 40, 50, or 60. We have to personalize a lot uh, the treatment of, of each kind of patient. A young myope of uh, 45, 55, you are not going to remove the lens because you have you could have other pro associated problems. And as uh, Damien said before, they are not usually happy with that. But however, a, a young hyperope, it's suitable for a, a, a lens exchange. 
in in the early 50s. So also I, I think that Presbyopia uh, changes. It's not the same with 45, 50 or 55. A, a, mm -hmm. a patient of 45 will be demanding something different that, than when he that 10 years later. So this is why we like the, the reversible procedures. Overall, uh, thinking in cataract surgery uh, some years after uh, that could uh, limit the IOL selection that nowadays we have so many IOLs, uh, di different IOLs in the market that we will find the perfect IOL for each patient. And if we have something that limits us, uh, that selection could be a, a, a pity. So this is why we think that a reversible procedure uh, will be the perfect choice for presbyopia patients. Thank you, Luis. Amazing, as, as usual. Ivo, from the campus, you're there. Uh, I know you work with a lot of presbyopia patients also. I'd like to, you, to know your thoughts before you, we go to with Aileen. And you are doing something about refractive surgery over there. Tell me more about that. Okay, thank you so much uh, again uh, for your invitation. I will, I will share my experience with you all. Um, Can you see at the moment? Perfect. Yeah, yes, perfect. Oops. Sorry. Okay, uh, when we tell corneal inlay, usually there is some uh, prejudgment because of past, because uh, corneal inlay until now means uh, biosynthetic material was implanting under the flap and uh, in the cornea, uh, and this was creating a lot of side effects. Uh, but today I will talk about a very different uh, product, which is not product, this is, uh, which is uh, corneal tissue. Also, I would like to show you this slide before my talk, uh, because we know that if uh, there is inlay surgery, uh, there is special uh, cascades, uh, energy metabolism change, cellular transfer, uh, transport, wound healing reaction, a complement activation and acute inflammation. There is a very long circle and this will create corneal haze. This is why uh, we, until uh, allogenic corneal inlay, uh, we had not a very old patients was not very positive uh, experience. This is one of our case we performed also uh, corneal transplantation. And also this is another corneal inlay. Uh, there was the FDA approval. Uh, and after FDA approval, there was a recall. So this, this made us in the world encouraged to use corneal inlay, but my experience was really, I, I'm very happy to share my experience. Uh, three years, I followed my patients. But before my experience, I would like to share a very, very short uh, history. Uh, Epikeratophagia was one of the first, one of first refractive surgery methods. In 1950 years, uh, in, uh, there was a donor tissue and there was a implanting this donor tissue over the host tissue. Uh, today we are implanting donor tissue under the flap. And uh, when we look at this uh, experience, uh, uncorrected visual acuity improved 90% uh, eye, and uh, there was a 116 surgeon, 352 procedure, and 28 year, years follow-up, there was no rejection reported, no visual loss reported, and it was reversible. This was for aphakia treatment when there is no intraocular lenses. But today, of course, we don't use epikeratophakia. Why? Because this is not precise. This is not well shaped. Uh, not there is a tissue damage, uh, and there is no storage, no self life. So uh, today, we until today, we stop uh, to use these methods. Uh, but uh, what we what I will talk today about corneal inlay. 
uh, pearl inlay or corneal lenticles was one of topic before allotex, before allogenic corneal inlay. Uh, but this lenticles was difficult. Please, I want to make this very, very, um, we should separate these two different things because when we use smile lenticle under the flap, this is not tested, this is not custom shaped, and there is no shelf life. Uh, there is not package immediately we are uh, implanting other patients. This is, uh, Allotex is not like that. Allotex is completely different, I will explain now. Uh, in this product, there is an eye bank tissue, there is not smile tissue, vision gift, uh, Alliance vision gift, eye bank. And this one cornea cuts tiny membranes. This tiny membranes is around 20 micron thickness and 2.8 millimeter diameter. As you see here, very tiny, almost invisible. And there is a, uh, on the glass, there is a eczema laser shaped. This is very important. Very sensitive OCT device can measure this. OCT devices is not like what we use in the clinical. This is in laboratory. So we use these tiny lenticles uh, produced from tested, shaped, very well shaped with eczema laser. And we can use this uh, lenticles uh, in the package like contact lens. And within two years, you can storage these tissues uh, very safely. And within two years, you can use. And uh, what we create with these tissues, as you see here, very nice steepening. Already Damien showed, I, I wish uh, we, I would like to discuss with him also. Uh, we are creating this with laser also. Already she, he showed. And now there is a steepening central area. But what is the difference of this topographic change? This lenticle is reversible. This is not laser treatment. We add this tissue and we created almost 2.5 diopters steepening uh, middle part of the pupil. Very central, very good centralization, as you see also. We can manage this very easy. So we can create near vision uh, by using this topographic change. We are creating spherical aberration. Now, I would like to show you lenticule. There is a tiny lenticule here. This glass looks like dirty, but this is not dirty. This is a Prezar one uh, solution. And when uh, we take this small lenticule, uh, around 20 micron thin, uh, we will implant this over the cornea. Uh, we are very happy initial clinical study in uh, our uh, group uh, performed. We, we tried to uh, improve technique. Uh, this was one of first products. And uh, when we put this lenticle into the water, this is also invisible because it is not easy to carry with uh, any uh, forceps. I was carrying this lenticule by using surface tension of water in this uh, ring. There is a middle part of the ring. Maybe you cannot see. It is normal. Uh, you can carry this lenticule by this way. So this is another example. Uh, we can you carry this lenticule with surface um, tension of water in the ring. And then we insert, it is easy centralization. We can find pupil, there is a flap, we open the flap. And then we carry over the cornea. When we take from the outside water, immediately lenticule, uh, can be implanted. Don't be confused. I wanted to show you also one of hyperopic lenticles. It looks like a little bit uh, higher uh, diameter. Uh, so also it is possible not only presbyopia, also uh, hyperopia. This is, oh, sorry. This is a uh, presbyopic lenticle, as you see. This is also minimal in uh, middle part of the pupil. And you can make uh, centralization, you can move lenticle, you can uh, control, and it is very easy. After implantation, when we put lenticle middle of the pupil, uh, we are waiting to dry. You can think when we put replace flap, 
it is same. This is tissue. And when you replace flap, how you are flap don't doesn't move. It is also same. When we close this flap, already integrated. Uh, only uh, flap closing is a little bit tricky because you you shouldn't wash interface. Uh, and when you close this, absolutely, I didn't see any slippage of any lenticule. So I'm sorry. We we uh, reported our first uh, study results. It was a first clinic initial clinical uh, study. But also, I would like to talk about uh, European study uh, results. Uh, there was a multi center study. Uh, it was seven center. Uh, we there was a uh, one hundred one emetropic presbyopic patients. Uh, there was the inclusion criteria, as you see here. Uh, and when we look manifest refraction after implantation, preoperative and postoperative, we, we induce little bit spherical uh, refraction. There is almost no cylindrical uh, in uh, cylindrical, uh, cylindrical refraction. So this is normal. We are only performing this lenticule non-dominant eye, non-dominant eye for near dominant eye. We don't touch dominant eye and uh, patient can see uh, near uh, very good than uh, binocular, as you see, preoperative and postoperative. When we look uncorrected near uh, visual acuity, here, preoperative, uh, 44 letters, and postoperative, there is very big change uh, when we look binocular and monocular, as you see, very big change. And uncorrected distance and intermediate uh, visual acuity when we look preoperatively and postoperatively. Distance visual acuity, of course, uh, for distance, we would expect a little bit less on non-dominant eye, but this is not like monovision. I cannot tell this procedure is monovision because monovision means we are creating myopia refraction uh, and patient cannot see distance after LASIK, for example, or when we use monofocal intraocular lens. This is not something like that. We are inducing in this treatment spherical aberration and tiny uh, myopic refraction. So distance visual acuity is not change very big uh, when we compare monovision other uh, procedures. And when we look also intermediate uh, visual acuity here, also there is the improvement. Uncorrected near visual acuity, distance and near preoperatively and postoperatively when we, when we compare uh, when mono monocular, there is little bit less and near visual acuity, of course, also uh, almost same. After six months, this is the most important. Uh, Long-term result is the most important. Uh, there is almost invisible lenticule because this is so stromal tissue. This is fresh corneal tissue. And then we look OCT, this is almost invisible. It is uh, in biomicroscope, in OCT. We can see a lenticule presence almost only by using topography. On topographic map, we can see central steepening. I showed you uh, before. And we can understand usually when patients visit us, oh, there is a lenticule. OK, <laughs> so also when there is a good vision. Also, I would like to share with you dance to metro results. We, uh, we have limited time, so I'm not talking very detailed, but just I want to show you there are uh, some zones. We separated some zones in cornea, and we wanted to uh, evaluate dance tometry because which is very important for long-term results, if there is haze or not haze, like biosynthetic material. 
And uh, when we look preoperative and postoperative uh, results in zone one and zone two, uh, as you see here, zone one is central part, zone two is uh, peripheral part in anterior, uh, central and posterior layer. Uh, in this, uh, as you see, preoperative, postoperative, there is almost no difference. And I want to show you by using this graph, uh, preoperative, and there is a first month and third month, of course, there will be increase. Even we when we uh, perform LASIK treatment, there is increase. Uh, and then and there, there is six months results also almost same level with preoperative level. We use pentacam densitometry. Uh, when we look peripheral part, uh, zone two, it is also a little bit changed. Uh, today, uh, recently last month, we evaluated also uh, third year uh, densitometry results. It is same level, I can tell, but we didn't continue at this period when we see same level, uh, there is no change, but also we will publish very soon long-term results. This is very, very important part of this, uh, this uh, lenticule. Also, this is another graph. Uh, Dancetometry is not uh, very different than preoperative level uh, on six months. When we look camera, I removed one of camera, uh, but when we look allograft inlay, this is invisible. It is really invisible. Also in our experience, we perform not only presbyopic patients, uh, we perform uh, hyperopic patients, young hyperopic group also very, is working very well. And my patients recently visited me and they are really very happy and they are asking me, other eye also they want. I don't know why, uh, because they are they have no side effect. They can see, and I never uh, gave any uh, glasses for reading uh, this group. This is also another study uh, we performed. We evaluated wave front aberration change. Uh, we induced spherical aberration. This is like. Uh, recently very popular VVT and AHANS intraocular lenses, central part little bit steep. Uh, there is a spherical aberration and this is same negative spherical aberration we are creating or central part of the cornea. So we know uh, this, this uh, meeting is related with uh, presbyopia but my comment would be, uh, we can sometimes help people uh, with hyperopic, with myopic uh, to solve their problem uh, with monovision or intraocular lenses. But today, emetropic presbyopic patients still challenging. And I believe allotex corneal inlay in the future uh, for emetropic presbyopic patients will be uh, will be future, will be solution, because these patients group are very, very specific. Uh, they don't want to change, uh, of course, distance vision. They have already good vision for distance and they don't want to lose that. And same time to see near is really not easy to create with other methods. And when, when we use Allotex corneal inlay, uh, this is non-invasive. This is very important. We can uh, do surgery within minutes, and this is reversible. I'm very, very comfortable when, we, when I recommend this procedure to my patients. Otherwise, I really don't recommend any, any alternative treatment. I'm not performing multifocal. I'm not performing laser treatment if patient is emetropic presbyopic. This is safe. There is no haze. And also this is effective. So I tried to explain my experience. I hope uh, it is clear. Uh, if there is any question, I'm very happy to answer. Thank you so much. This is my uh, team. They are collaborating me for these studies. We are working together. Thank you so much for uh, opportunity. Eileen, what, what an incredible uh, presentation. I mean, I think we are all 
we are surprised and excited about this. But it's not just the future, it's the present. Thank you so much. It was an incredible, again, presentation. I would like to have your comments, Ivo. Uh, again, you are an expert in Presbyopia. What do you think about this? You have a new tool, a new option for your patients in the future. Yes, yes. So I believe in the future, these patients, this, uh, this method will be, will be very common. I, I believe from my heart because it is really reversible. As a surgeon, we all want reversible surgery. Mm -hmm. uh, this is non-invasive. We all can create flap very easy. Just create flap. Just the most difficult part to see uh, invisible lenticule to insert. This is really easy when you do a uh, learning curve is not very difficult. And then uh, if there is any problem, any question, take lenticule back. I only remove one patient's lenticule back because it was my first experience and patients uh, has tiny astigmatism and he was a little bit psychological. And I remove back this lenticule and patient immediately complained, I cannot see near. Okay, I will not do it. <laughs> So immediately return back, no problem. Uh, also, I performed this lenticus uh, hyperopic, hyperopic uh, presbyopic patients. I created monovision. And very interesting, even I put lenticule hyperopic patients, they can see, even they have monovision, they can see distance and near very well. Probably this is related with spherical, uh, negative spherical aberration uh, induced. Thank you, Eileen. It was, again, incredible. Also the Damien presentation. I don't know if he could connect again. He has a, he had a trouble with the connection, but thank you, Damien. Your, your presentation one was all, also outstanding and amazing. Ivo, from the Palma University campus. Can you hear me? Yeah, perfectly. So what I'm doing is I'm picking some notes uh, and I'm, I'm okay. behind a couple of very interesting concepts uh, because we have seen many, many different uh, solutions for presbyopia. Faustino was also talking about even eye drops. So uh, I think we're gonna have a lot of uh, solutions for presbyopia, but I keep in mind what just Damien Gatinel said about safety and precision, right? I think those, and, and also a treatment that can be permanent uh, because, you know, eye drops could, you know, you put it, you forget it. So when I offer something to my patients, I'm very interested in a solution that can be permanent, that can have a lot of safety and a lot of precision. And I think refractive surgery gives us that. And me as a cataract surgeon, I'm always trying to be a refractive surgeon. So what I'm doing uh, here is I'm gonna show you a little bit uh, with the great edit. We did, for example, in this case already, because we wanna do fast, we wanna do a flap right here, okay? So we have our patient, look at that. We did, uh, we put the interface. It was so easy, guys. The thing is, I need you to understand that here, the planning is very important, but the technique itself is gonna be very, very simple. You can see right here, I'm gonna have two pedals, two pedals. And then I'm gonna have an interface Then I'm gonna put on temporal and grab with two hands and then just press one pedal and do the section where the section is correct. With just, just center the eye, do a perfect applanation of the cornea and Technically, it's very, very simple. It has many, many, uh, you know, little secrets, but you can train in a place like this with simulation. And then you're offering a patient something that is very important and it was said for many, many, uh, by many speakers. That is safety, precision, and also reproducibility. You can do this, you know, again and again and again. So here we're showing... Uh, the most personalized way to do it. Another thing that many speakers said 
So uh, they, when they say future, they were saying again and again the word personalization. And please, Edith is going to help us also how personalized was this tree. Well, uh, as well as the Dr. Ivo said, we already performed a plot with these uh, matches exactly with the ablation profile. If you can see the profile right there in the scene of the etching laser. So, we are going to perform a contour addition treatment, fully personalized, treating the higher order aberrations as well as the lower order aberrations. As you may see, we made a, in the modified section the new uh, refraction that we are going to treat in this patient, which is not exactly the same as we manifest in the refraction. As you will see, uh, minus two, minus one astigmatism are 10 degrees. The topolizer measure minus 1.26 at seven degrees. So we made some adjustment to, uh, to treat a fully personalized treatment compensating the sphere and the cylinder, taking care about the criteria for the contour vision. So uh, we right here has a fully personalized treatment in our campus. Perfect, perfect. Uh, I hope you can you you, you can hear that uh, address. It was a little bit you know cut in the past. Can can, can you guys hear that? Oh, yes, of course. Perfect. Uh, and, and let, let yes, me say another something. thing because yes, you know sure. we have the the micro the micro rec uh, device here. So what you can do is if you are from any part of the world and you have some doubts, you just put a beam splitter and then you are doing refractive surgery with an expert, watching your surgery and talking talking to your your head. So this is how technology is completely changing the game. So we we'll go back to you and then we will do the ablation. The ablation. Thank you, Ivo. And that's one of the, th the things we can do in the Ophthalmo University campus with our mentors also. So, uh, Jason, the great Jason Pennycock uh, is okay, here okay. for us. Okay. I really want to say thank you, Jason, because you were doing such an incredible work in every webisode. Uh, your presentation are, believe me, amazing. So thank you so much, my friend. This is the last one, at least here in this uh, summit. So whenever you want, the screen is all yours. Thank you. Um, thank you for having me. I hope you guys can see my screen. And let's get started. So the evidence corner has been about the road to the top. Um, we've been through several um, different things, different concepts. And what we really wanted to focus on during this, during this particular evidence corner or, or series uh, we wanted to focus on providing you with tools and providing you with different ways of improving your practice. So if we go a little bit back and we look back at what we did, we start with the concept of measuring everything, wasting nothing, adding value. Then we went um, into knowing and upgrading whatever's on your tool toolbox. And today has been a perfect example of that. Um, last week, we spoke about how to choose the right tool. And today uh, we're talking about how the future is now. So when we talk about the future is now, uh, we wanna think about three things. One is plan ahead, number two, build infrastructure, and number three is fail often, fail early. And let's start with plan ahead. So plan ahead, um, you've, always, you've all heard this phrase before, skate to where the puck is going, not where the puck has been. This was something that Wayne Gretzky said back in the 90s. And it, it, really, it really speaks to the concept of not just thinking of where you are right now, um, but actually trying to get to a place and planning for that um, correctly. So um, I actually had a, a few questions. Um, Faustino, if you don't mind, I'm gonna put you on, on the spot for a second. Um, where do you see yourself in 10 years? This is the classic interview question, but I, I wanted to, to hear from you, Faustino, today. Where do you still see yourself in 10 years? Ah, uh, great question. Uh, I didn't tell you anything because I wanted to surprise you. <laughs> no, no, it's good. 
uh, in 10 years from now, um, I would love to be a mentor. Okay. So um, are you going to be wearing glasses in 10 years? Are you going to be operated from your cataract surgery in 10 years? Don't age yourself, but what, how do you see yourself refractively in 10 years? In 10 years, I see myself with uh, extended this of focus, I think. Okay. <laughs> or I will do an early. Fantastic, thanks. So um, that other question, what technology are you most excited for? Um, Andres, what would you say out of all the technologies that you've been reading and, and, and um, researching? I, yeah, yes, yeah, thank you, Jason. I think uh, on my case, I'm excited about the customized laser surgery. I mean, as you, um, Faustino said, for every patient, a different treatment. For me, that is exciting and is very important in the future. Fantastic. So now I'd like all of our viewers to think for a second, where do you see yourself in 10 years? What technology are you the most excited for? Um, what are the, are, are you really keeping on top of whatever is out there? Are you upgrading your tools? What will you use if you were the patient? Um, and the concept here is once again, you know, set a goal, set data-driven goals, and then find a method to climb, find a way to get there. You can only skate to where the puck is going to be if you know where it's going. And I wanted to give you a quick example. Um, there's something that is called the electric generator, generator revolution. So uh, what you're seeing on screen is an old time factory from maybe 1907, where all power was, was obtained from a steam generator. And what they had was a process that the steam was in the mid middle of the room and then the process started and things happened around the steam, the, the steamer. So when the electric generator came in, they actually had a loss in productivity and it seemed like it wasn't quite, quite worthwhile. Even though it had a lot of advantages like being smaller, you know, like less invasive, it could be everywhere. Um, it was easier to, to give more power to more uh, machines with less resources. Even though that was happening, the efficiency failed. Why? Because when people started to use the electric generator, they still tried to use the steam generator process. So you still had things going all around the room instead of trying to find a way. When did this change? This changed when they actually um, located the generator, the green stock, outside of the room and started putting the process alongside the walls. And that allowed them to actually be more efficient because they found that many of the steps were not necessary anymore. So why am I saying all this? I'm saying it because revolution requires transformation. If you want to plan ahead, you need to make sure that you know that you have to also adapt with those changes. So plan ahead. Now build infrastructure. When it comes to building infrastructure, let me ask you another question. If you wanted to get 400,000 people to the summit per year, what will you do? Do you buy 400,000 ropes so each can um, climb on their own? Or do you build one ski lift? When we think about infrastructure, when we think about how to approach the future in terms of infrastructure, we want to think about the ski lift and not necessarily what that is. So now I'd like to ask Dr. Kilik, what will you think is our equivalent of a ski lift when it comes to refractive surgery? What's one thing that you think that could be applicable to not just one patient at a time or one clinic or, or, or practice at a time, but something that you could apply across everything, ac across the whole industry? Jason, I'm sorry, Dr. Kish had a trouble oh. probably with the connection. Sorry. She, she had to see. fly, take a well, flight. Andres, yeah. Then I'm going to ask you yes. to take her place. Can you answer that? Ah, what is your equivalent of ski lift? Well, of that's a good today. question. But what about the teamwork? I think it's very important, right? Excellent. And that it, it's going to be a great concept. Yes, in, in that what idea. Building to the teamwork is a platform or something that is infrastructure that you can apply across everything. That's that's an excellent example. Mm -hmm. So when we think about infrastructure features, we want something that is persistent. That means that it's available everywhere that is transparent because you know what it does, 
that is reliable because it does what it's supposed to do most of the time, that is tolerant because people that are working um, can make a few adjustments here and there to improve it. It's effortless. It doesn't take additional effort. It doesn't take a lot of work to get things to work. It's versatile because you can use one team or one infrastructure for many different things. Scalable because it doesn't only apply for something at, at the production of five, but you can apply it to a projection of 50, 500 or 5,000 or whatever. And it's elastic. Once you have that in place, you can start working or thinking of other things that can be done with that same infrastructure. Like the perfect example that Andres said, you know, when you have a team, when you build a good team, then that infrastructure will carry you across many different um, areas. And that's how you can start um, future-proofing your practice. We have to remember that this is all part of a cycle of innovation. And that's something that we spoke about last week, how the cycle of innovation depends on data. It depends on being um, evidence-based and the concept of being values-based surgical care. You know, we need to be able to link people and what they value, what they're interested in with science and with the best um, available evidence or outcomes. So finally, oh, talk about fail often and fail early. So um, Evo, this question is for you. Tell me about a technique that didn't work out well for you in cataract surgery or whatever it is. Evo? Hello? I don't know if you, Evo, it's third. Yes, yes. I'm here. Ah, okay. I'm, I'm <laughs> here preparing the ablation, Jason. <laughs> okay. So, Evo. Don't, don't let me think a lot. Please just ask because another. Of that, I'm going to ask Lisandro. <laughs> yes, yes, please. Everybody gets questions today, Evo. Okay. Lisandro, tell me about a technique that didn't work out quite well for you. Well, you think about it, I'll tell you about my story. I went to Germany and I saw this amazing nucleus disassembly technique. And then when I tried it on my own, um, yeah, it didn't work quite well. So I learned that that wasn't the technique for me. What about you? Do you have any, any techniques that you remember that you can share with us? I, I cannot say one technique, but, but you said uh, an interesting thing that the, whatever the technique it be, uh, it must be adapted to your uh, surrounding mm -hmm. to your reality. Mm -hmm. So if you try to implement a technique that it, it, it doesn't match with, with your reality, that won't work. That's exactly. it. And, and the important part about this is knowing that once you fail, you are allowed to change, to adapt. Once you fail, you are allowed to improve. Um, that doesn't, just because this particular nucleus disassembly technique didn't work out for me, didn't mean that I stopped doing cataract sur surgery forever. It just meant that that was not the technique that I was going to use in the future. So when we first spoke about this, we spoke about areas of opportunity. We spoke about adding value. We spoke about how you can break down each part and create these continuous improvement cycles where we define what our problem is, where we measure data, where we prove, and then we sustain that change. And we do this all through a platform of leadership that is pushing the change. And today I wanted to, to get a little bit more into that. So improvement is equal to D2K plus K2P plus P2D. What's that? D is for data, K is for knowledge, P is for practice. So the cycle actually starts when you build a learning community. And a learning community is the people that are with you in the OR, including your patients, your team, um, the people that you talk to, your colleagues, all these people start thinking about how to get better results. Then you have that team think about what data is needed and that data is converted into knowledge. Once knowledge is converted, once you have the knowledge, you apply that and use that knowledge to, to improve what you're doing. The difference between data and knowledge is that knowledge lets you do something about it whereas data is just information that is being fed. Once you have the knowledge, you have to take that into practice. And once you have that practice, you have to once again, turn that practice into data. So this cycle is what allows us to do improvement. It allows us to get better results. Improvement is equal to D2K plus K2P plus P2D. Fail early, 
if you fail early and if you fail often, you can improve and you can make these cycles quicker and improve a lot faster. How do you do this? You have cycles that are a plan, do, study, act cycles. The plan part is where you define the objective, the questions, and, the, and you make predictions about what you expect to happen with the, with the particular um, intervention that you're gonna have. Do is having the intervention done. You carry out the plan and you collect data as you're doing it. Study, you analyze deeply the data that you recovered and then act, you plan the next cycle. You say, what am I going to do next so I can improve again? This is how you continue to climb the hill because the faster you fail, the faster you improve. A culture of continuous improvement is the only way to future, your, to future proof your career and practice. I'm gonna repeat that. A culture of continuous improvement is the only way to future proof your career and practice. You have to continually plan what the next step is going to be. And once you know what that is, you have to, to do it, to study what your results were and act on the next cycle. So once again, if you want to learn more, there's a lot of a lot more written about this in this book and this particular resource, which is freely available. And um, right before we started, I got news from one of my um, good friends, um, a, a, an, an old colleague that um, passed away recently. And we've been focusing a lot on the summit, but I wanted to leave just two things with you. The first one is the future is now. So we have to seize the moment, enjoy the, the journey and then share with the view. And also um, this African proverb that says, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, let's go together. So thank you everyone. Um, I hope this is helpful for you. Oh Thanks. my God, Jason, amazing. Wow. You did it again, my friend. As always, thank you so much. Impressive, impressive, believe me, was an incredible presentation. Thank you, everything. Okay. We are almost done, but before that, we have to go with uh, Ivo and then with Lisandro. Ivo, are you ready for the ablation? And then we're gonna go with uh, the last talk. It's something amazing from Lisandro that we were waiting for, uh, for it. So tell me, Ivo, are you ready? Yes, yes, sure. The first thing I wanna talk about this uh, words that we had from Mentimeter and what we is the future of refractive surgery. Mm -hmm. Very interesting, right? Uh, we're going to be looking at the future again with concepts that Dr. Gatinel said about safety. And that's exactly what I'm doing here. So I want more uh lisandro can you hear me i think evo has yes, perfectly okay evo had a trouble with, with the connection today's zoom is not its best day so would you like to start with your presentation, Lisandro? We're going to okay. talk about the future of refractive surgery. Okay. Uh, let me share my screen. Can you see it? The surprise. Yes. Okay. Hello, everyone. I will talk about the, the future of refractive surgery. Uh, and I think it's pertinent to, to make a distinction between the near future and the distant future. Uh, we, when we talk about the near future, I, I mean the next five years, for example, and then the rest for the distant future. And without getting into this technology that I, we, I will talk about, let's refresh some basics. Uh, maybe you remember this formula, it's to calculate the power of a lens. So if you see the, the power P depends on the radius of curvature of this lens. And all the techniques that we have been seeing in, in this webisode, uh, I mean, uh, and all the, the refractive techniques uh, like PRK, SMILE, LASIK, 
all works exactly in that uh, in that spot of the equation in changing the radio, radius of, of curvature of the lens. But we forget that that equation has another terms, that n letter that you see there. That, that's the refractive index of the of the material and of the of the medium. And that's exactly where this technique called lyric laser induced refractive index change. It's work. It's working. So it uses a femtosecond laser. Uh, it's not like the, the regular femtosecond um, because it doesn't use a high energy uh, laser beam that that cuts the tissue. But instead, it uses a green light, a low energy green light femtosecond laser that only breaks the bonds. Uh, between the molecules. Uh, you can apply these, these techniques in the corneal tissue. You can apply it to IOLs, uh, regular ones. You know, doesn't have to be special ones. And even in, in contact lens. So how does it work? It breaks the bonds of the molecules and it creates uh, new spaces between the... the, the I can hear. Uh, so these this new spaces gets filled with water and because the water has a lower refractive index than, than the rest of the tissue, it lowers the, the refractive index in the treatment part of, of the tissue. Uh, like you see in this animation, you can um, print uh, some, some different patterns that are hydrophilic, more, more hydrophilic, so it gets water inside and lowers the refractive index. Uh, and these patterns are really, really thin, so you can make more than one and even retrieve uh, the, the tissue if you need to. And even you can cancel one, one, uh, one pattern if you are not uh, happy with the results. So it's a, a technology really, really uh, with high potential in the future, I think. You can even turn a regular IOL into a multifocal uh, IOL. Uh, and even you can cancel a, a multifocality IOL, uh, just printing the, the opposite pattern in, in, the, in the material. Um, so I think, is this technology re really disruptive? Yes, I think so, because for example, in the corner you can print this, these patterns, you doesn't have to make a flap, you doesn't cut uh, uh, fiber, fibers, nerves, so you don't get uh, dry eye. You can apply many, many treatments if you are not uh, hitting the target. Uh, and as I said in, in the IOLs, it, it will be important because, for example, uh, you can offer multifocality to patients that already has a monofocal IOL inside your, the, their eyes. And we can say, like, like we can forget about the, the refractive surprises. So if you have a surprise, you apply this technology to the IOL and you hit the target. So I think this will be a, a really game changing technology. Uh, and Let's talk about a little bit farther from here, the distant future. They say that it's extremely easy to predict the future. The hard part is to, to get that prediction right. So <laughs> with that in mind, I will try to, to predict like a fortune teller. Uh, I think that regenerative medicine will, will be a, a huge part of our life in, in some years from now. Uh, new drugs, aquaporin related drugs, uh, gene therapy, stem cell therapy, new biomaterials, uh, all that technology will combine to, to give us the, the possibility to, to, to maintain our cornea and lens as healthy as, as when we were 20 years old, for example. And that will be the end of cataract surgery. I don't think so. Because also we will, we will have high technology IOLs and IODs. I, I call it like that the way the intraocular uh, devices. Uh, not, I'm not talking only about accommodating IOLs that of course we will have that, but devices that will um, give us a supervision like 2010, 
uh, zoom abilities, uh, head up displays with the, the capacity to, to display vital signs uh, in, in real time or help identify objects to low vision patients, and even augmented reality right inside our eyes. So imagine that any application of your smartphone can send information straight to your eyes. So that, that will be a game changing again. So this uh, leave us with the big question. So will you prefer a forever young, healthy human eye, limited healthy human eye, or will you prefer to have a superhuman cyborg eye? That I think will be the, the decision we will have to make in a distant future. So that's it from, from here. Thank you very much. My friend, um, amazing, my friend. Thank you so much. Incredible, uh, the perspective and the future. Thank you so much. Your presentation was also impressive. Okay, we're finishing. We have a little surprise for our speakers. Before that, uh, Ivo, you have to finish your surgery. And then yeah. now you become a, a refractive surgeon. Exactly. Can you hear me? I'm sorry about the, yes. the loss of connection. Yeah. Okay, so yes. I already took, took the time to, to put the flap up and I'm ready to do the, the ablation. Hope you can see there. Can you see me? Luis, give me some nice. feedback, please. <laughs> Amazing, I'm seeing perfectly. Let's see what you do with it. <laughs> Perfect. So, remember you need to guide me. So the thing here and, and this, the, the, the important thing here is to center the eye. There you go. Perfect. And I'm going to do the animation. Hope you can see it. So what I'm doing is pressing a pedal and I'm doing a completely personalized treatment with Contura and the patient had his surgery. So again, one of the important things I wanna talk about uh, is not only uh, the planning of the patient and having the best, uh, the best uh, plan for the patient, but also to have a technique, as Jason said, that can be you know, easy to perform with a lot of repeatability. So back to you, Andres. Thanks, thank you so much, Ivo. Okay, and we are finishing. Thank you so much to all our speakers, our assistants, uh, the attendees. Are, you guys are amazing. Thanks for your support. But before this, before we say goodbye, we have a little surprise for Damien, Eileen, and Luis, and some other people. Lisandro, whenever you want. hear the audio, Lisandro, maybe because you're mute. You can, can hear the audio? No. Oh, let's start again, sorry. Now? Yes. Yes. for a few words about uh, Luis. Uh, very easy to uh, talk about Luis. He came here uh, for about uh, a year uh, for his fellowship. You know, he did an outstanding job. He already came uh, with some uh, great training uh, from England and of course from his training in Spain. Uh, so he was uh, very humble during his training. He taught us uh, a lot about uh, refractive surgery and he was a really hard worker. So Luis, congratulations on your current success. I know you will continue to succeed in whatever you're doing. 
um, uh, keep keep pushing the field. And I just wanted to show you this room to remind you of all those cornea ulcers that you treated here. Uh, this is the cornea OD room where Luis uh, worked really hard for a year. So uh, congrats and uh, uh, I'm looking forward to continue to see your success. Many congratulations, Eileen. I'm so pleased to be able to do this for you. And to say a few kind words, it's very easy. You've been such a leader in ophthalmology and one of the things I like most about you is how prepared you are to try new things and then how equally prepared you are to teach those of us who follow in your footsteps. So congratulations on another wonderful milestone and keep up the good work and keep on showing us the way. Take care, bye-bye. Hello everyone. It will be very difficult to describe in 45 seconds how important was and still is Damien Gatinel in the career of many of us here at the Rothschild Foundation where he leads the cataract, cornea and refractive surgery department. And I think there is no need to, uh, to discuss about the expertise uh, of Damien, who is a true leader and mentor. And his CV speaks for him. But I'd like to say a few words about the man behind the genius. And uh, all of us here will agree that uh, he's very kind, gentle, and humble, despite all what he already achieved. And when I once asked him about what was his objective for the department, he, he was saying that he wanted to build a department in which uh, all of us and everyone who will be working in the department will be happy uh, to come to work everyone, every day. And I can say that uh, this is another one of his big achievement. Congratulations, Damien. Ivo Ferreira our brother from Brazil, Uruguay, United States, Mexico, from everywhere. It's incredible to see how things have come along ever since our first encounter with the Experience Academies. It was great to have you here in Brazil. It's great to participating with you in all our meetings. It's great to see how Tommy University has really evolved into this incredible, advanced, and innovative campus. I'm really looking forward to all that is coming along. Saludos, hermano. Beleza. Hello, everybody. I'm so honored to be here talking about an amazing woman, Shamin Lebetsky. I know her uh, since 2016 back in Costa Rica when she went uh, to be our great leader in surgical. And she was so amazing. Every time you think about passion, you think about innovation, if you think about accountability, leadership, you think about Shamin. That's how she is. And I'm so blessed that I had the opportunity for, to work with her and be my mentor. So I wish you, Shamin, all the best and everybody on this uh, event as well. Have a great day. Andre Benati, as your partner, friend, and colleague from Cordoba, Argentina, I want to congratulate you and your team for all the learning courses that you are organizing to share your enormous knowledge with others. As one of your first mentors, I am really proud of you. And I want to wish you all the luck in the world in the next sessions. From Córdoba, Dr. Facundo Rodríguez here. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, guys. What an incredible surprise. Luis, one of your mentors from Miami, our great uh, Guillermo Mezcua. Amazing, amazing. Thank you so much. He's very, very good friend. So this is why he said those words. <laughs> I, I don't know if Damien, are you there? But we, we have a, a amazing words from Alan Sepp, yes, one I of am. the surgeons. Oh, Damien, thank you so much for your time. Incredible words from Alan. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, my friend. One, uh, well, Aileen. She, she has to she had to go but Ivo another friend of us the great uh, Jonathan Lake uh, was an incredible and beautiful message for you he, he's like a brother to us half Uruguay and half Brazilian you know always there with us such amazing words I, I didn't expect that uh, thank you guys and thank you Facundo one of my partners here in Argentina thank you guys Lisa and Ivo for organizing. Well, we have to finish. 
Uh, we are so happy. Faustino, some last words. Shemin is in the airport, but we want to finish this. And we want to thank because it has been such a, a lot of work, but we are so happy, so honored to have all of you guys with, with us. Faustino. Well, uh, what's to say? Uh, thank you, Talmo University. I think that you are a group of professionals, incredible. And uh, what you are doing is teaching and mentoring in a different way. I think that this is uh, very important, what you are doing. Then you are recruiting uh, a good panel, well, an excellent panel of KOL, key opinion leader and, and mentors. So, but creating an atmosphere of family, right? So hopefully the people, the participants that we see behind the scenes are happy as we are, because I think um, they, they mentioned about Damien Gatinel concept, and I think that is important. What we need to do is to come every day and be happy what we do, right? Uh, in mm -hmm. teaching and with these webinars, the pandemic of webinars, everything could be very boring and you are making the difference, showing things how can be done differently, right? So congratulations and from our side, everything is recorded and maybe we can enjoy one day all together with a beer and looking forward. <laughs> we hope so, yeah. We have to do, do it very, very soon. Uh, before I uh, give the word with my, my brothers, my friends, Lisandro and Ivo, I want to thank all the translators, again, the speakers. Uh, thank you so much because, again, it would have been impossible without you. The attendees, thank you so much for all the colleagues from all over the world for supporting us. And one more thing, during the week, we're going we're gonna to do the giveaway from the scholarships. Uh, so stay tuned and for sure tomorrow, a lot of you, we can be there with Ivo and me and Lisandro and other mentors learning a lot of refractive surgery. Lisa, Ivo, it's all yours, guys. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Just, wanna... uh -huh. just, just thank you for, for giving me this, this opportunity to, to talk to, to talk about the, what, what really matters to me, that is the future and technology. So thank you and I enjoy it. Just uh, for me, just the last words, I was taking notes. Uh, I think what Damien said about LASIK is here to stay. He talked about safety. He talked about precision. He, many of the speakers talk about a personalized treatment. Uh, I, I, I love this one, uh, you know, about the refractive surgery being the new cool, right? The brains of the surgery, those I, I, optical engineers behind, uh, you know, a better vision. Uh, love what Jason said about processes and discipline and that this needs to be more than a technique. It needs to be an entire process for an entire journey with the patient. And lastly, Faustino, Uwe, Shemian, thank you so much for the support and all the ideas. Uh, this is truly something done with industry and academy working together, looking in the same direction everything for our patients and for people to learn all over the world. And Andres, uh, so happy for you and so honored to be with you as a partner after what you did. I think you did history with this refractive, you know, uh, webisodes that were incredible. Thank you so much for putting this together for people, not only now, but in the future. Edith, thank you so much for your support here. Uh, you know, we did so much work here in the campus and we want to thank everybody for giving us their, but the most precious thing, their time to learn. So hope to see you in the future, guys. Thank you.